uh, is Liam from Nevada, pronouns are he, him, asking why did sex evolve? Liam, did you have any particulars about that that you wanted to dig into, or is that the whole thing? Um, same color as, what was it, Sunday? Oh, yeah, hey, yeah, I remember you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. I, uh, I'm re- I'm, I started The Ancestor's Tale, and, uh, hey! I was thinking about it, and I'm curious, yeah, and I'm curious, um, like, what is the purpose of, of biological sex? And, and then I guess, uh, as yeah. an additional question, um, a little small into that. Um, when it first evolved, would it have been like you know what we think of as male and female with like the larger and smaller gametes, or would it have been something completely different? Oh, my dude's talking about gametes up in here. Yeah. Okay. okay so <laughs> you got you right. You already know the terminology, and I'm super stoked about it. So there's a couple of things you got to know. Um, first of all, what what sex is really, really, really good at is creating variation. It's 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 good at blending uh, uh, different alleles together. Um, so so for those of you, you know, in the in the chat who aren't familiar with the terminology, you have DNA that it's the code for life, and 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 everything's controlled by DNA. It's not really that's a gross oversimplification. It leaves a lot out, but whatever. Um, and DNA is broken into little chunks called genes. Each gene codes for a specific thing. That's also gross oversimplification. Don't worry about it. And so you've got these genes uh, that do a thing, and there's different flavors of these genes. So there's not just one kind of gene for you know height, for hair color, for eye color, for uh, a cold tolerance, for for you know fat accumulation, for whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of different variations to these genes, which we call alleles. And so. The idea behind, you know, sex, but sexual reproduction is the fact that you are, instead of just having clonal evolution, where you have one individual, like a bacteria doing binary fission, just cloning itself over and over and whatever mutations carry over do, which is very slow, you're now blending different alleles from different parents, and that produces more variety faster. And it allows um, deleterious mutations to be flushed out faster. It allows beneficial mutations to spread throughout the population faster. It basically puts evolution on a little bit of a hyperdrive. And that's the generally ex- like accepted hypothesis when we talk about the evolution of sex is that it increases variation. However, what's really important to remember is that there's different kinds of natural selection. There's different kinds of you know, models of what we see in selection. Um, and there are actually several experiments that show sexual reproduction as opposed to asexual reproduction not producing a tremendous amount of variation and it actually stabilizes things and reduces variation. And that's where it falls into the second thing that I talked about where it really helps flushing out deleterious mutations and it helps kind of like make things stable. So, um, you can watch episode three of my my show, The Light of Evolution, on my channel, and I talk about these different uh, um, you know, patterns. Perfect. So you know what I'm talking about with the patterns of evolution, where you have directional selection, where the whole population kind of slides into one direction of, of like a, a trend. You can have stabilizing selection, yeah. where the extreme yeah. ends of the traits fall off, and you just have more frequency in one section. Or you can have disruptive selection, where the graph collapses in on itself, and the normal ones, quote, quote, all die out and the extreme weirdos tend to become more populous. Um, and so this is what sex allows us to do. You're always going to have like the squirrels. Yeah. 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 The mice or whatever it was. Yeah. So you're always going to have variation within a population, but if you can blend these alleles together and not just have this one's, you know, a little bit more colored this direction, or this one's a little bit bigger, that direct or whatever like that. Instead, you have some of the color genes and some of the height genes and some of the weird, whatever other ones all blending together. Um, it's like, you know, shuffling a deck of cards, different combinations producing different variety and some of the combinations are better. Um, now, it's this part, second part of your question was, when sex first evolved, what would it look like? And for that, you know, remember, you, you, you didn't have little amoebas with dicks or anything, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything you know, too crazy. It would have just been, you know, horizontal gene transfer. And you can see that now in, you know, if you look at bacteria, bacteria, you know, reproduced by, by binary fission, Except also, you can look up bacterial conjugation, which is freaking bacteria sex. They literally connect, they crack a little hole in their cell wall, and they can just transfer plasmids, which plasmids are little chunks of, of prokaryotic DNA. They can just transfer, swap them. 
like flipping them all about. They can lit. It's like bacteria sex. Um, and then there's also horizontal gene transfer, which comes from, you can get, uh, it's this thing called transformation, which is the stupidest term for this. It's something so wonderful. It's such a simple term. Um, you can have um, a, a, a non virulent bacteria, bacteria that are harmless and have them here in a Petri dish and then take some harmful virulent bacteria and kill them all put fire to them and completely kill them. They're all dead. And then you just mix them all together. And the live, non-virulent, harmless bacteria will literally just slurp up the harmful bacteria's DNA and become harmful bacteria. And they can literally like just take on Whoa. these new genes. Um, bacteria are really good at just like sucking up new genes. Um, and I actually did this once in a genetics lab to prove that I could. I took some uh, some some E. coli and I put them in a thermocycle or get some really hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold over and over and over. And so it what it did is it broke their cell walls open. Like if you ran a car really hot and then dump water on the engine, it's going to split in half. Um, and so I broke their cell walls open and then I mixed in a plasmid for antibiotic resistance, blended them up, and they absorbed it. And I was able to smear these bacteria on an antibiotic uh, uh, plate and they fucking grew when whereas they weren't supposed to be able to. Had to murder them with fire real quick um and so but yeah this is a thing that bacteria can do they're really good at that and so when you talk about early sex that would have been in eukaryotic organisms like us these eukaryotes would have been able to transfer genes this way um uh, and and it probably didn't start off with actual gametes um but as as you get multicellular organisms then having dedicated cells for that kind of reproduction would have been really really helpful um and that when you get into that whole thing is where you get into you know polyploidy and like why you have haploid cells versus diploid cells and like i talked about in that episode you have you know diploid species like us or you have hexaploid species like wheat or you have uh, octoploid species like strawberries and you have lots more reasons and lots more possibilities for sexual variation also one more thing on that and then i'll shut up is that some species use that ploidy they use the the set of chromosomes they have for sex determination so when you're talking about males versus females um ants for example all female ants have are diploid and all male ants are haploid so if you have an ant egg that doesn't get fertilized it just turns into a male and if it does get fertilized it turns into a female so the haploid eggs that don't get fertilized they only have one set of their chromosomes they still develop and they're a male and that male can only pass on that one set of its chromosomes which means if you think about this male ants can never have sons they can only have daughters because a fertilized egg is going to be female they can have grandsons if their daughter lays an egg that doesn't get fertilized that'll be a male ant but they can never have sons they can only have daughters how fucking cool is that liam does that answer your question because i will talk about it for the next five hours and i gotta stop Did uh, that is, that is fascinating. <laughs> I, that's like that that's like uh like the you you are where you eat thing taken to a uh, a very like like a, a weird level I, I never would have like thought about that that's what i'm talking about you literally <laughs> slurp up the dna and become the thing it's like a dumb cartoon i injected the dna and i grew wings it's like that kind of shit but in reality <laughs> very small i just want someone to talk about me the way forrest talks about biology <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want for my life. <laughs> I need such hard drugs to get the kind of serotonin that Forrest just got. Oh man! That oh dude, really I'm stoked to watch. To death. This okay. is okay. A, a, an excitable young parson learning about the universe, dude. I'm all over the place. This is exciting. I love okay. it. I'm so happy. Now, now I've got to know though. Okay, so if okay, so if that was the case, then there wouldn't uh, the the does that um, kind of the bacteria that has that that early form would it um, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have a male and a, a, a female version, right? So when would it, um, that kind of when would multiple like sexes uh, evolve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or would that did I miss something or or like what's yeah, the, no, you didn't, you didn't at all. That's a great question. Uh, so it's important to remember two things. Number one is that you know I I I, I talked about bacteria a lot, and it, it's really easy to take what I said and run with it a little bit. And I don't want you to uh, you haven't yet, but just in case, um, you know, the bacteria are remarkably complex. Like when we talk about early life forms, that like the you, you know using the term bacteria would be a bit of an oversimplification and it would actually give them more credit than they're worth. Um, but like, so bacteria are radically cool. Um, so these early things, uh, they wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't have had what you could call true sexes. So 
There are species today that don't have true males and females. They have only one size of gamete, but they still have different mating types. So things that kind of behave in what you could call a male fashion or a female fashion. It's also really important to remember that biological sex isn't just it. While it is usually defined by gamete size, a big example of what I just said, and also many other examples, there's lots of ways where that doesn't actually work. And there's more than two sizes of gametes, or there's only one size of gamete, or the same individual produces both gametes, and yet there are still, you know, different sexes and different groups. And like, so there's a, a lot of wiggle room in there. So when we talk about early life before the production of actual gametes or germ cells, then yeah, it's kind of up. Like I, I, I can't think of any actual data that we have on what that would look like off the top of my head. But as far as like what it more than likely would have looked like based on what we can see around us today, um, it is entirely possible for there to be what you would call mating types without actually having what you might call true males and true females or anything of that sort. Um, there are still like there are protozoa and things like that that do that today. Um, yeah, there's 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 lots of things, lots lots of variation. Biological sex is one of those things. Like when I was talking about DNA and I said, hey, all of this stuff is what you learn about DNA. And I just recited what you teach in middle school. And I kept having to say that's not entirely true. Biological sex is the same way. We talk about gamete size. We talk about males and females. We talk about all these different things. Um, and we were leaving out a massive piece of the picture just to make it something digestible that we can talk about in two minutes. You know what I mean? So I, I oh, hope that I helps because it, it is real fuzzy. Okay, there we go. Sorry, you cut out for Do a I still have you um, Oh, sorry. Have that? Yep, yep, I can hear you now. Um, Sweet. Okay, um, that, that, is so, that is so fascinating. Um, I'm going to, for Christmas, I, I put on my, my little wish list the, uh, the book that I think that you were recommending that um was which was um what was it called evolution's rainbow i think and yeah i'm picking i'm picking that up for christmas hopefully um that's a does that one. does that cover that that whole does that uh uh cover like the no. what you're talking about so it, this this book talks a lot about like it, it's it's sexuality and 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 sex in nature and people um they have uh yes so the the first chunk of the book is all about sex and diversity and 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 sex within bodies and sex roles and whatnot in animals um and then it goes into you know humans as well well humans are animals but you get the distinction she's trying to make so like um but yeah it starts out with the rest of the animal kingdom yeah, and then yeah, yeah. the second half of the book the uh, the sorry, I say the second third of the book is all about you know in humans and then the last part of the book is about you know cultural perspective of gender because remember gender is a social construct not a biological one and so she talks a lot about different you know cultural constructs of what gender and sexuality are and how they play out which is really important if you're interested in bioanthropology so that's a really dope book um, uh, there's a few others that. Uh, I definitely don't think are outside of your reading range, but they are outside of what's appropriate to recommend to a child. So like, I'm trying to think about what I can cover here, but like there's a, there's a lot out there. And if you look up, like, honestly, if you just Google, you know, good books on, on evolution and sexual behavior, sexual dimorphism, um, there's, there's quite a bit out there. That's really, really, really good to read. Um, ask your parents if you can buy this one. Uh, this one is called evolution and human sexual behavior. Um, it's, it's not incredibly graphic. It's, it's, it's not pornographic. It's just, it talks about human cultures, but a huge part of this book is also looking at the animal kingdom and talking about like, we do these weird things kind of like these lizards and we do these weird things kind of like these fish. And it gives a lot of context, but it is a little bit adult in some of the reading. So, you know, definitely ask your folks about it first. Well, Liam, cool. you're freaking oh, awesome. You Thanks so much for calling back. Okay. Yeah. Do you have anything else you wanted to ask us about before we move on to the next call? Well, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for us. Sorry I didn't have a question for you, Shannon. Um, but you're great too. And then um, when, you, when you have the time, if you have the time, if you want to, it'd be uh, great if you could put a, a list of like, um, sci like, you know, the science books that like the ones that you have on your bookshelf, the ones that you like on your mm -hmm. website, because that would be very handy. I put, 
I have them on my uh, my my Patreon Discord. Uh, one of my patrons asked me for pictures of all my shelves, and he wrote out all the names. So I might might transfer that over to my my website sometime if I have you know ten minutes to do it. Okay. Well, Liam, Thank you're you. a rock and, star. Uh, Thank you so love, much for calling love in. Love both your channels and everything you do. Thanks, Liam. Yep. Thanks so much, Goodbye. Liam. And uh, you're a rock star, for dude. Take care. Me. Keep studying. Hey, it's Jimmy Snow here. I'm the executive producer on the line with a fun fact. Did you know 100% of the hosts of this channel enjoy eating? It's true. And if you would like to help contribute to their ongoing addiction, you can do so by going over to Patreon or becoming a channel member. There are show-specific, host-specific tiers. Those are awesome. But also, you can leave a super thanks with a special little highlighted comment. You can like, comment, and subscribe. All of those will help fill our, our, our whittle, whittle bellies. By the way, check out some of these, this content over here. <laughs> Algorithm, what next?